I was asked to talk a little bit about what the future looks like for Gen Z, for the, for the digital generation. And I thought the best way to try and answer that question is to run a theory by you. And it's a theory about football that comes from two economists named uh, David Sally and Chris Anderson, who a couple of years ago wrote a book about football called The Numbers Game, which is the kind of book about football that you would imagine two economists would write. They, they do a kind of rigorous analysis of the game and come up with a series of conclusions about football. And in one of their most interesting chapters, they ask the question, what is the best way to make a football team better? Is it to improve the quality of your best player or to improve the quality of your worst player? And their answer is that without question, the best way to improve a football team is to improve the quality of your worst player. Right? Now, why is that? Well, if you think about it, it's obvious. Football is a game of mistakes, right? Games can typically be decided by one or two goals. If you look at why a goal happens, it's often because somebody, a defender, makes a critical error deep in his own end, and that leads to the other team capitalizing on that mistake uh, and, and scoring a goal. To the extent that your weaker players are more likely to make mistakes than your stronger players, it makes sense to upgrade your weakest player. It's also the case that football is fundamentally interactive. The only way to move the ball effectively up and down the pitch is to, for everyone to share in that burden, right? You have to pass the ball around. There's a famous clip on YouTube of, a, of Tottenham Hotspur in a Premier League game, and they pass the ball 48 times amongst their own teams before they score a goal. So if you can find it easily on YouTube, it's a kind of riveting um, video. But the point of that is that every single player on Tottenham touches the ball at least once in that goal sequence. And had even one of those players not been up to snuff, the whole goal would never have happened. They would have turned the ball over to the other team, right? And not only that, when you analyze those 48 passes that made that goal, you discover that the lowest paid members of Tottenham Hotspur touched the ball the most in that 48 uh, goal uh, pass sequence. That was, that whole sequence was wholly dependent on the talents of the weakest players on the team. You can actually break this down um, statistically, and, and Sally and, and Anderson do that. They, you know, so those of you who are football fans will know about Castrol scores, which is used in the Premier League, where you assign every player a score from 0 to 100, the best player is 100. Uh, and they, they ran a simulation over a 38-game season, and they said, Suppose I have a, I upgrade my best player, who's an 87, five places, so he's a 92. How much better does that make my team? And the answer is, it makes your team a lot better. Uh, you will score 10 more goals and five more points over the course of a full season. Then they said, well, suppose you do the same degree of improvement in your worst player. So suppose your worst player is a 25, you upgrade them to a 32, how much better is your team? you will score 30% more goals and twice as many points over the course of a given season if you had, than if you had upgraded your best player. It's not even close. There is only one route to improving a football squad, and that is to identify your weakest link and make it better. Football is a weak link sport. Now, compare that to basketball, right? Huge sport in America where I live. Uh, what is basketball? Well, the first thing you notice about basketball is that it's not mistake-driven like football is. Basketball players make mistakes all the time. It doesn't matter. They just recover and you do other things. Basketball is not interactive in the same way that football is. The greatest basketball player in the world, LeBron James, if he wants to move the ball from one end of the court to the other all by himself, he can do that. Nobody can stop him. He doesn't require the participation of every one of his teammates in order to score a basket. Um, in fact, if you look at the two greatest basketball teams of all time, and I realize now that I'm probably venturing into territory where a few of you can follow, but the two greatest basketball teams of all time were the Chicago Bulls teams of the 1990s and the, the Golden State Warriors teams of five years ago. 
The Chicago teams had three great players, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman, and the great Michael Jordan, right? The rest of their, the, the two other players on that team were, they were okay, they weren't great. Their fifth player, their center, was a big, slow, lumbering white guy from Australia. Not terribly gifted at basketball. If you look at the other greatest team of all time, the San Francisco Warriors, who a few years ago, three great players, Steph Curry, Draymond, Draymond Green, and Clay Thompson. Who was their fifth player? A big, slow, lumbering white guy from Australia. If you're trying to build a great basketball team, it doesn't matter who your fourth and fifth players are. You can just randomly walk down a street in Australia, point to some tall guy, <laughs> and say, come and join our squad. Basketball, in contrast to football, is a strong link sport. You make your team better by upgrading your best player, right? The quality of a team is wholly dependent on how good their greatest player is. That difference is quite dramatic. And I think it's a very useful way to conceptualize the way organizations function in the world. We can look at any group of individuals, and we can ask the question, is that group a weak link organization or a strong link organization, right? So my question for you is, what does the future look like? When you look out 10 and 15 years, do you believe the future is going to be strong link or weak link, right? Now, we all know what the past is. The past was strong link. It, 200, 300, 400 years ago, you wanted to make your country great. What did you do? You focused on making the strongest links of your country even stronger. I've just been on holiday in Italy, and if you travel around Italy, you see these, even in the poorest parts of that country, these magnificent churches and monasteries and castles from the 15th and 16th century. Those were not built for the benefit of the ordinary peasant working in the fields. No, they were built for the benefit of a very, very small group of elites, right? Educated clergy, noblemen, you know, wealthy people. They're, the idea that drove medieval Italy to greatness was the way we can outcompete our enemies is to make our cultivate an elite that's better than everyone else's elite. You could make the same argument about the latter half of the 20th century. What is the dominant uh, sociological transformation of the post-war era in the Western world? It is the construction of extraordinary centers of elite excellence, the rise of the research university, right, which happens all across the West, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge. I could go down the list, right? That's what emerges. The rise of elite hospitals, right, that you no longer have, you no longer, you, the way that you achieve excellence in the field of healthcare is to build a handful of centers of true quality in urban areas where everyone migrates to if they want uh, quality health care. Or you look at even in the corporate realm, what is the dominant narrative of the, the last 20 years of the 20th century? It's the rise of these, of elite banks like Goldman Sachs, of elite software companies like Microsoft. Of, that was the notion of how you built your country, your economy, into a world leader. You focused on the very strongest links and made them better. All right, that's the past. What about the future? Is the future different from that? It, or is it the same? Is the future football or is the future basketball? Well, let me give you a couple of stories that will maybe help you with this. One is some of you will, be, will, will know about the extraordinary situation that the aerospace manufacturer Boeing struggled with um, or in recent years probably the biggest uh, crisis in their history. They had a plane called the 737 MAX, which uh, was the, one of the most sophisticated planes they'd ever built. They spent $4 billion uh, uh, planning it. It cost $100 million to buy it. It was supposed to be the savior of the company, and they introduced it to great fanfare. And what happens? It's grounded for several years. Why? Because of a flaw in something called MAX, the maneuvering characteristics augmentation system. What is Max? Max is a software system which 99% of pilots will never 
use. It's uh, relative to the, the sophistication of the entire airplane. It is a tiny amount of computer code that costs a handful of dollars. But because of a defect in that handful of computer code, the entire aircraft was grounded. And Boeing ended up losing $20 billion over the course of five years. Right? Does that sound to you like basketball? Or does that sound to you like football? I'll give you another example. I was chatting with a friend of mine recently who was a, uh, uh, a physician in a large teaching hospital. And he was describing to me a case of a, a man who had come in after being in a dreadful traffic accident. He had nearly died. In fact, he would, he would have died under normal circumstances. But it so happens that they would manage to get a helicopter to the crash site very quickly, bring the man to one of the great trauma centers in the region, a team of world-class surgeons to descended on this man, did a series of operations over the course of the next 24 hours, saved his life. Man leaves the hospital, you know, goes, is brought back to health, gets married, has children, and one day he's walking along the beach and he collapses and goes, he's dreadfully sick. He's taken back to the hospital. They realize he has a raging sepsis infection. They end up having to amputate one of his legs. He nearly dies. His life is derailed for months and months. Why did he get the sepsis infection? Because one of the things that happened to him when he was being operated on was that his spleen was taken out. And when you take out someone's spleen, you have to give them a vaccination against a very common type of vac bacteria that your spleen will normally protect yourself against. Somebody forgot to give him the vaccination. So here's a man being operated on for 24 hours by a team of world-class surgeons at a price tag of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Someone forgets to give him a $2 infection. And what happens? He nearly dies again. All of that work nearly comes to naught. What, is that, what do those two examples tell us? They tell us that as systems get more complicated, as the as, the, as domains of activity, professional activity, get more interconnected, things start to resemble football and not basketball. In the old paradigm, medicine was strong link. In the old paradigm, when we talked about what good medical care was, we talked about the quality of the surgeon or the quality of the diagnostician. You know, it was all about, was that doctor really good? What medical school did they go to? What kind of training did they have? What was their record? We focused on the individual. But now in a complex world where you're doing far more in medicine to help people and where an operation involves 10, 15, 20 people, we're not talking about the excellence of one person anymore. We're talking about the quality of the team. And the team is only as good as its weakest link. We have moved, in other words, in that domain and in the case of Boeing and the 737 from playing basketball to playing football. I had a conversation recently with, uh, with these two executives, with an executive uh, uh, from IBM, and he was talking about um, edge computing and 5G, and he was talking about it in the context of firefighting. It was a fascinating conversation. And he said in the old model, you know, when you were fighting fires, you had a command post with an experienced commander in that post who gave directions to a team of people out in the field, right? Who gave orders to firefighters to follow a certain strategy based on information that was brought back to him. And they said, that is no longer the model that is being used to fight fires, but you know, those huge forest fires in places like California. Now what you do is you have 25 SUVs, and you put a bunch of servers in the back, and you deploy a crew to the scene of the fire, and they put sensors down throughout the forest floor, and they collect and analyze that data in real time. They send out drones to gather even more information, and they formulate a strategy on the spot for fighting the forest fire. In the old paradigm, you needed one great commander, and everyone else was just following orders. In the new paradigm, Every one of those teams has to be good enough to coordinate and make intelligent decisions about fighting that fire in their given area. We've gone from needing to have one great person to having to, be, having to have many good people, right? That is a move from, uh, from basketball to football.
Now, what does this mean? Well, it means we have to approach the future with a very different mindset. We've been operating in a strong link world for generations now, for centuries now. And all of a sudden, the stakes have changed. The way in which we solve problems and build teams has got to change. Are we living up to that task? Right? Have we recognized this transformation? I worry that we haven't. I worry that in the way we approach a lot of problems in our world, we're still playing by the old rules. To give you an example from the world of, of American higher education, you know, there's been a real trend in recent years for billionaires in America to give very large gifts to American universities, which is a wonderful thing, right? We're talking about gifts of 100 million, 200 million, 300 million dollars. Um, we all want, we think it's great if when rich people give away their money, right? That's nothing to cast aspersions about. But when you look at where they're giving their money, what do you find? You find that they are almost entirely giving their money to the elite universities, to universities that already have a lot of money. Why do they do that? Because they think that the world of higher education is basketball. And the way you get better is by making your best universities even better. But that's not the right strategy in a world that's playing football. If you look at the top eight most elite schools in the United States, uh, they collectively educate 100,000 students, and they have between them an endowment of $140 billion. That is $1.4 million per student. If you look at everybody else in America, every other student, hundreds of thousands, millions of other students, they have, uh, their endowment comes out to $16,000 per student. So we have group number one is $1.4 million per student. Group number two is $16,000 per student. And where does all the money go? To group one, to the group that has already has all the money. That, in a world that is moving in the direction of football and not basketball, that's insane, right? That makes no sense whatsoever. If the best way to solve our problems is to strengthen our weakest links, why are we giving all of our resources to elite universities that educate a tiny fraction of the population? A couple years ago, that billionaire John Paulson uh, decided he wanted to give $400 million uh, to build a school of engineering, and he gave his money to Harvard University, which uh, has $50 billion in the bank. And I was, this just drove me so nuts that I went on this crazy Twitter uh, rant, and because you're all trapped here, I, I thought I would read you some of my tweets. <laughs> if billionaires don't step up, Harvard will soon be down to its last 30 billion. <laughs> Apparently, 200 million is earmarked for a satellite campus on St. Bart's. And then this is my favorite. It's going to be called the John Paulson School of Financial Engineering. Um, I could go on. I won't bore you with more. I did like 10 of these. But my point is, this is crazy. This is an example of someone who fundamentally misunderstands the nature of the world that we're living in and misunderstands of the, the nature of the future that we're headed towards. And if the world that we're building for all of you in this room is going to be an improvement on the world that we're living in now, we have to understand that the rules have changed, right? You know, it's even hard for, if you look at the oligarchs who buy Premier League teams, what's the first thing they do? They don't go and strengthen their weakest links. They go and they spend 40 million euro on a, you know, some brilliant uh, uh, striker from Croatia, right? They don't get it. These are people who have every, oper every resource in the world, access to the most brilliant minds, the people who understand football, and they buy us, they spend millions and millions of pounds on a team and you're on a team, and they completely misunderstand the nature of the sport that they're buying into. That guy, David Sally, I told you about who wrote that book, he does consult, he, for a while, did consulting with Premier League's teams, and finally he just stopped. He's like, it's pointless. Like, they don't understand the nature of the game. They're spending, why are they spending 40 million euro one player when they should be spending uh, 10 million euro on four good players, right? Now, why am I telling you all this? Because I suspect that many of you in this room are strong links, that you're the product of strong link institutions. You went, you have really good educations. You're very bright and poised and motivated. You're the kinds of people who are the, who will be the winners in whatever field that you um, enter. But it's really important for you to understand 
the nature of the change in the world and economy in which you're operating. You will be part of teams over the course of you, your career, but the success of those teams does not depend on strong links like yourself. It's going to depend on how good your weak links are. Right? And your challenge as you go out into the future is to understand that we're not playing basketball anymore. We're playing football. Thanks so much. Welcome, thank you very much. I, it seems to me like you're doing a manifesto anti-elites. That the big scene of the, next, of the last 200 years, more or less, has been basically to give too much importance to the elites, and now maybe we should focus on the middle class, mm -hmm. which is basically also like the, the real column of our successful Western societies. Is my intuition wrong or right? No, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think that the kind of over um, emphasis on, on elite excellence is a very hard habit to break. We got into this habit, particularly in the, I believe, in the kind of post-war era, where a number of Western countries became fixated correctly, I think, in that era, on the notion that the surest way to uh, to economic success and social success was in building up the quality of those lead institutions. And it's very, very hard once you have placed all of your cards on that strategy to switch gears and to understand that something mm -hmm. fundamental has changed. You know, if you, it's funny, I, as I, when I started thinking about this idea, I would, I would have conversations, I've had conversations with corporate leaders on this very question. And it's fascinating how often that they immediately see, once you point this out to them, the logic of this. They'll say, yes, in my institution, the problem is not the quality of my chief financial officer or my chief operating officer or my chief marketing officer. It's that what's holding me back is the person in the middle of the distribution. Mm -hmm. I can't find quality people at that level. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's the modern world, right? That's the firefighter problem. If the best way to fire, fight fires is at the point of the fire, that, must, that has to change everything you do about the hiring and development of talents in fighting fires. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned like the more like the fi financial elitism, for example. Well, I read a bit about you. I heard to a couple of your podcasts. They're all very iconoclastic. And at some point in one of your, uh, your, your, your books, you say that too much information can kill your intuition, your discernment, your way of judging. Mm. And you know, I couldn't help linking what you just said on stage to the current movement of wokeism in those elite, super rich universities, where sometimes we have the impression that we have social theories stemming from the, allegedly the most important minds in the world, which are basically a nonsense, an absolute nonsense. Yeah. And I thought, if you know, it, that was not like the hyper sign of the, of the, the end of this elitist um, cycle. Yeah. Yeah, what, I mean, what you're describing is um, uh, is a kind of uh, what's the what's the, the the best word? Decline is one word, but it's it's more than that. It's a kind of decadence, intellectual decadence. That when you put all the resources in the hands of a very small number of people, um, and you essentially communicate to those people that there is a their future is secure, that they are insulated from pressure or responsibility to anyone else, what you get is this kind of decadence, this kind of focus on things that are not central or not important, that are disconnected with the, the broader issues that a society is facing. And I do think that's what we're seeing right now in, um, in many Western countries, is, um, is a kind of, uh, it seems irrelevant, a lot of their um, intellectual pursuits. It runs the agenda. It runs totally our political agenda in the West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, it's interesting. Once you leave the United States, you, um, it's always refreshing to see how clear-eyed people from other countries are about the problems in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same problem in Western Europe, Malcolm. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and also, following on your comparison between the basketball society or a football society, First, I understood that maybe it's not a good idea to make a country great again. <laughs> and second, I, let me plead now the case more of the basketball 
uh, type of society. Because the way you describe the football is also like a very interlinked system of perfection, where everyone is controlled, where everyone has a specific function and must deliver. Everyone, no, there's no uh, weak link, basically. It reminded me like of a very heavy bureaucracy. And I was thinking, I mean, where is the place for the free electrons in this football type of society that you just described? Yeah. Well, let, I mean, it's interesting. Let's pursue this metaphor a little bit more. When you look at, I'm guessing many of you are football fans. So when you look at the evolution of football over the last 25 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, post the kind of Dutch revolution of the 70s, um, and what you've seen is this move towards a much more interactive, um, you know, possession-based kind of uh, football, the kind of football that's, that I was describing, this kind of weak link football. It's rather the Spanish school for me, but... Yes, Spanish, yes. It's, it's also the Spanish... Uh... Now, so your question is, do we see in that style of modern football less or more creativity than we would see in the traditional football of the 1960s, the kind of football the English were playing until quite recently, right? I would argue there is more creativity and... Uh, more improvisation and more excitement in modern Spanish-style football than there is in the old, you know, kick the ball, kick uh, the ball in and chase after it. Yeah. So even within the idea that we're distributing responsibility among all the players, somehow in that what seems like something that should diminish creativity, the opposite is happening. Mm. What we're doing is creating a structure that allows for real, true genius to flourish. I mean, a Lionel Messi, for example, flourishes in that kind of system in a way that he would, may not have at all flourished in the 1960s, mm -hmm. right? I think there's, uh, that there is a kind of beauty and greatness in this kind of uh, interdependent teamwork that was not present in the sort of top-heavy systems of the past. Mm -hmm. um, you see, and... That also brings me to another topic on which you have been publishing recently and uh, maybe uh, against the mainstream is you're not a big fan of teleworking. And it seems that in your football model, the interaction between people is very, very important. And especially, I mean, you're somebody who is intuitive, you're a man of nuances, you're a man of discernment, and you seem to believe, correct me if I'm wrong, in these interpersonal um, relationships. Are we heading in the right direction by just claiming that it's better for everyone, including for the planet, that we stay home and work only from our laptops? Well, it depends what you're doing. So I think it's a mistake to say that all work is more efficiently conducted in the office and a mistake to say all work is more efficiently conducted at home. I think what we need to do a better job of doing is identifying the kind of work that requires interpersonal interaction, that requires physical presence. So my company, for example, our work is creative and collaborative. Everything is done in teams. Um, everything, we stand or fall on the quality of our ideas and our creativity. What we found during COVID when we were all at home was that kind of work became really hard to do, which shouldn't come as a surprise, right? I think that, you know, after several hundred thousand years of human, of human evolution, there is a reason why we evolved in groups, because there's a certain quality that, of interaction that's important for learning, for motivation, for inspiration, for all those kinds of things. At the same time, there's clearly a, a large body of work that doesn't require that, that where solitary work is fine. You know, where when I'm, write, when I'm in writing mode, I don't need to be in an office with a group of people. It's fine for me to be in a cafe by myself or at home. Or it doesn't, you know, I'm, when I move to other stages in the creative process, then I rejoin the group. So I think the, the challenge is for us to begin, become a lot smarter in differentiating between what different kinds of work require. Mm -hmm. um, the second point, I, sorry, the second point I would make is it also depends where you are in your career. So... If someone has had the benefit of 30 years of experience in interpersonal settings, I'm a lot less concerned if they want to work by themselves than I am about someone at the start of their career. Learning 
there's a stage, the learning process in complex learning, uh, uh, complex professions takes a lot longer than I think we care to admit. 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. And I, I think accumulating your 10,000 hours in preparation for expertise is very difficult when you're by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think it is. I think that's um, uh, it's just a kind of fundamental fact of how, of how we operate. Mark, even beyond the, the, the working place, I'm personally worried about the atomization of societies. I have the impression that now we live in a world where everyone has his favorite app, his favorite movies, his favorite series, his echo chamber, uh, you know, that according to the feed he gets. There's n actually little we have in common. Look, look at the United States. I mean, it, now it, you, you have race wars, you have sex wars, sexual orientation wars of any kind. And I had the impression, maybe I was very naive, that at least the best place to socialize, even to find your, your future wife or husband, was work. These yeah. things are not happening anymore with telework. I just have the impression that now we are heading to a society that could be the dream of Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, you know, the, the most interesting observation that I've seen recently about um, where we are right now and where we're headed as a society was for the last 50 years or so, uh, the Gallup organization, the famous polling organization, has asked a cross sample of people in the West about how satisfied, how happy they are with their life. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 0 would be you're profoundly unhappy, 10 would be you couldn't be happier. And historically, when you look at those uh, results of that polling, you see a bell curve. Small number of people are zero. Small number of people are 10. Most people are right in the middle, reasonably satisfied. Six, five, six, seven scores on that test. We observed that pattern for a generation since we began polling. Then the internet age happened, and we began to see slowly a change in the curve and now what we've seen is it no longer looks like this. It looks like this. The number of people who report, uh, who give a zero to their life satisfaction has quadrupled in the last 10 years. The number of people who report 10 out of 10 has doubled in the last 10 years. So there's a group of people who are clearly are winners in the digital age, who are doing better, who are thriving, who could not be more pleased with the way things have turned out. At the same time, there are a group of people who are very clearly losers, who are deeply unhappy, for whom the world of the last 15 years has steered them in a direction that they never intended to go. And so it's that division, it's sort of a version of what you're describing. It is understanding why, what is it about the people on this end that makes their life so happy? Can we duplicate that? And what is it about the group on this end that makes them so unhappy? And can we help them prevent that? That's the challenge. That looks like the perfect example of a basketball society, no? It's a basketball society. Yeah, that so, is a basketball society at a time when the basketball uh, paradigm is no longer the correct one. Mm -hmm. Now I fully see your point. Yeah. Speak a bit, if you don't mind, about adversity. We are, this, this, uh, this event, this turning point, was specifically meant at the, what we call the Generation Z. I don't like too much this, uh, this denomination, but sometimes, speaking also about stereotypes, we, we tend to think that this generation is emotionally weak, that they are not precisely faced to adversity because they live a very virtual life. What is your stance on that? Do you think it's true or not? And what advice would you give them? Yeah. I don't believe it's true that there is emotional uh, weakness. I think that's absurd. And I think all what we're seeing is something else, which is if you look in previous generations, if you looked at a cross-section of 1,000 people, 1,000 people born in 1960, you would see you know, some portion of them, 100 of those went to college, had professional careers. Some portion of those didn't. And some portion of those, maybe the bottom 500, very quietly went away and had unfulfilling, unchallenging lives on the bottom fringes of society. We basically forgot about those people. What we're doing now is we're saying that's not acceptable. We would like to take as many of that 
thousand people and give them a chance at a, a fulfilling and meaningful life. So we've raised the bar, right? And whenever you raise the bar, you're going to be much more aware of, your, of those instances where you have fallen short, right? You're making, we've, we've also at the same time increased dramatically the, the scope of work, the demands of work, the complexity of work. So it's much harder to be a successful professional today than it was 50 years ago. Do you have any idea how easy work was for someone born in 1950 when they were 35 years old? They worked a fraction of the hours that people today work. And it was much easier. They were, I mean, I even, I'm old enough to remember what it was like being a journalist in the 1980s. When you left your workplace at 6 o'clock, nobody could reach you. <laughs> you were done. I never took work home. What was the point? All of my work stuff was at work, right? <laughs> I, you have no idea how easy it was. It is so much harder now. So when we observe higher rates of unhappiness, of dysfunction, of whatever in the current generation, it's because they have a lot more on their plate than previous generations did. It is not evidence of any structural inferiority among the current generation. Mm -hmm. I see, but they might need actually extra resilience to resist, the, to resist those trends, no? Oh, I think that's absolutely yeah. uh, the case. I mean, you can see that to give an example, a good example of this is athletics. If you look at what, if you compare the training of a football player or a runner today versus the training of one 50 years ago, there's no comparison, mm -hmm. right? But what does that mean? That means the likelihood of injury or burnout or whatever in a contemporary athlete is far higher than it was in someone from 50 years ago. 50 years ago, people in the locker rooms of, of, of Premier League football teams were smoke. chain-smoking cigarettes. <laughs> I mean, it's absurd, right? <laughs> That's true. And so some of them were even the best players, like George Best. Yes, you know? George Best. It's like... Getting, and then getting, going home and getting drunk every night. And then he was still the best. The idea that the best player in the game could be someone who chain smoked cigarettes and got drunk every night is an absurdity today. Yeah. I mean, absurdity. Yeah, so we have, we have indeed a much more uh, de demanding world. Yeah, same thing. And let's speak, if you don't mind, also about the place of faith in this hyper complex world, very technical world, where the world where all of us have a little, as probably a function, where everything needs to be hyper professionalized. What's the place of faith and our spiritual life yeah. in, this, in this society? Well, historically, the role of spirituality in our lives has been to give us a source, an, a, a source of strength, um, an alternate source of sustenance, a world outside and larger than the world that we inhabit, right? Mm -hmm. These are all things that give us a kind of armor against the world, um, the world that we're involved it's in. It's much needed today, then. Much needed. So at precisely the time that... We need spiritual armor, where the world has gotten a lot more demanding and dangerous and all those kinds of things. We have removed spirituality from our lives to a large extent, right? We're much less, and I think that is a tragedy, and we're all suffering a little bit more as a result. Um, I think that it's extraordinarily unfortunate that we have become less devoted to our faith um, in the current age which is an age that where our faith would, is more useful than, than it ever been in the mm -hmm. past. Thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. We're going now to turn to the audience. We have time. It's once in a lifetime occasion to ask questions to Malcolm Gladwell. And there's no cancel culture in this room. So they can ask you whatever they like. You can answer whatever you like. And if someone's offended, it's too bad for them. It's not for the speaker to be sorry. So we have already quite a few questions. Uh, I like your uh, football allegory very much. I think it's very useful. I've used it in my life, thank you. And uh, I think it's also true of uh, countries on this planet that uh, or the fate of humanity may depend on not the strongest link but the weakest link. And uh, how can we uh, educate these countries and how can we... Uh, we try to isolate them, but... Uh, I think it is limited, and how can we educate the, the countries that are not in a good shape? I mean, I think there's a number of different, it's a really good question, a number of different sort of answers to that. One is simply by setting an example, um, that if the, 
the, the rules of the modern age are different, then um, it's up to the most prosperous and highly developed countries to set an example for the rest of the world. For example, let me give you the following thought experiment. If I gave you a, an infinite amount of money, a relatively infinite amount of money, and said you could solve one problem in the world, what problem would you solve? Um, there is a weak link answer to that question, and there's a strong link answer to that question. A uh, hundred years ago, I might say, I would like to build elite universities to educate a class of people who can bring forward a series of scientific revolutions that will blah, 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 blah. Today, I would say, I probably would like to have a really effective vaccine against malaria. Uh, in other words, I think more could be accomplished from liberating large areas of the developing world from the extraordinary burden that malaria places on uh, the people in the lowest third of the population in, you know, for example, sub-Saharan Africa. That would be a huge win. That would do more to push that region forward and bring a new level of prosperity to an enormous portion of the world. Now, if I ask that question of people in the most pro five most prosperous countries of the world, right? United States, Germany, uh, Australia, whatever they are. If I ask that question of the population, how many, what percentage of the population would give you the answer that the best thing we could do for the world is to come up with a malaria vaccine? I suspect a very small number. I suspect most of them would come up with some kind of strong link answer to that question. Um, so it's that kind of, I think it's incumbent on, you know, when, when Bill Gates goes around saying, I think the most important thing we need is a malaria vaccine, people need to listen to him. He's actually right, you know. There's a, there's a strong link, a guy who grew up in a strong link world who has made a complete turnaround and devoted his life and fortune to, to, to coming up with weak link solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Next question on my right. So you said that uh, we are living in a basketball society while we should be living in a football society already because the change is happening around us. It's us who are not changing with it, right? So what do you think, what is holding back the change from happening? Because I feel like in a lot of areas, we already have knowledge since 10, 20, 30 years, or even uh, since longer times, and people or the systems, they're just not uh, acting on it. Somehow it's not, uh, not happening. Yeah. Why can it be? Well, let me give you a tell you a story um, that I think will help illuminate that. I had a conversation once with the, 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 the CEO of a, an elite hospital in the United States, a big hospital system, world-class hospital system. And he had taken over the hospital 10 years previously when it was a relatively mediocre place, and he had built it into a world-class institution, spent, raised huge amounts of money, hired top physicians in every discipline. Three or four of the departments of this hospital were among the best in America, if not the world. He'd really achieved this extraordinary success. But he had this problem, which was that every time they did surveys, they asked their patients to rate their level of satisfaction with the hospital. They were getting low scores. And he said, this just baffled him. He was like, this is one of the greatest hospitals in the United States, but we're getting scores from our patients which suggest that we're some mediocre place that no one should ever go for care. And he couldn't figure out this puzzle. And he kept trying to upgrade the hospital, you know, the level of quality and the talent, and the scores still kept getting lower and lower and lower. And finally, he realized that when patients uh, evaluate a hospital, they're not evaluating their experience based on the quality of the surgeon or the cardiologist or the neurosurgeon or whatever. They're evaluating it based on their interactions with the nurse who comes to them in the night, the, the person who answers the phone when they call to make an appointment, the person who greets them when they walk in the front door, the orderly who comes in and, uh, and uh, cleans their room and changes their bedclothes. All of their... They're, they're evaluating it based on the people at their level who they interact with on a daily basis. And he was thinking entirely in strong link terms when patients were thinking entirely in 
weak link terms. Now, why did it take him so long to understand that? It t- he said t- it took him 10 years to understand that. Because he was someone who was entirely a function, a product of strong link environment. He himself was a former top surgeon. At every step in his life, he had been rewarded for being the best and the brightest. And everywhere he went, he saw systems that rewarded the best and the brightest. And he thought, and when he entered medicine, that's what medicine was. And because he was so isolated from this transformation, and because the transformation had happened so quickly, he was completely left unawares. I mean, remember, we're talking about a move here from from basketball to football that has taken place in less than a generation. So I think it's just, it's that. It's just our leaders grew up in a different era and this change is happening too quickly for them. Thank you, Malcolm. The gentleman on the back with the red t-shirt. Mr. Gladwell, or maybe Malcolm, if you may. So my comment and somewhat question goes to one statement. Donors give money for those institutions who already have money. As a professor at a small college, obviously, I'm also thinking, what to tell this wonderful Gen Z? Yeah, you know, so what you're saying is that in order to alter these uh, patterns of behavior that are, um, you know, I use the example of rich people giving money to rich universities in greater and greater numbers, we have to alter the, the kind of social reinforcement that's given to people who are engaged in this behavior. And right now, if you are a rich person and you give $500 million to Harvard University, you are applauded for your decision in a way you would not be if you gave $500 million to a small liberal arts college in Michigan, right? No one's interested. The prestige is all associated with giving to the prestigious institution. And that is you know, profoundly counterproductive but it is a function of a society that is overly invested in the, um, in the fortunes of elite institutions. Like if you, the, the extraordinary fact about the eight that I mentioned, of the eight most elite institutions in America, colleges in America, is among, between them, they only educate 100,000 students. I mean, that's an, abs- in a country of 380 million people, That is an absurdly small number. But if you were to read about American universities at any time, you would think that those were the only eight schools that existed. Everything is about Harvard and Yale and Stanford and MIT and, you know, Princeton and Princeton and, you know, and it's a crazy system. And I think you're right. There has to be some way of altering the kind of self-reinforcing feedback loop that we're rich people give money to rich institutions because other rich people have given money to rich institutions and everyone sees that as a path to social prestige. What do you think uh, about the general description uh, of the Generation Z um, in media or in books? Uh, I mean, the generation is lazy uh, but open mind and some kind of uh, stereotypes and, and so on. General descriptions of Uh, of generations are useful only up to a point. So we'd like to pretend that every single generation has a profoundly different character, and I think that's ridiculous. I think you see a general, dis- you know, a, a general um, uh, uh, distribution of characteristics in every generation. What changes is what characteristics in a given generation we choose to focus on. And what, gen- what also changes is, on a very kind of broad conceptual level, the, organi- the ways in which generations organize the world. So if you grew up in the Depression, you did really organize your world around the idea of scarcity. Right? You, it's really hard to, if you grew up with nothing and grew up in a generation where as growing up as a teenager or a child, you saw resources being taken away from you, and then you went through a trauma of war, that's going to shape the way you see the world ever since. Similarly, I think that it is useful to talk about the generation that comes post the internet as being one that's very focused on the organizing principle of the network, 
as opposed to the hierarchy. Right? It's a non, it's a, your generation, to the extent that you, most people in this room are quite young, you're, you're, you are anti-hierarchical. And you can see that in a lot of the ways in which you make sense of the world. And, and I think that's, that is a useful generalization to make about young people. Beyond that, I'm, I'm a little bit dubious of, I think a lot of the, of the stereotypes that are used to describe the digital generation are, being, are simply fictions that are made up by people of my generation who want to look down their noses on young people. And it's just not useful behavior. Especially journalists. <laughs> Especially journalists, <laughs> yes. Um, gentleman there. I would like to ask, uh, what's your advice for us? So now that we know that weakling systems are better, uh, how should we convince the world's leaders, angel investors, and the politicians to so support these uh, systems? How, how should we force them to action? Uh, that's a really good question. Do I know how to convince politicians to, to create a football society? Basically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the logical place to start is at the kind of policy level and hope these, this kind of... Uh, that our leaders can articulate a notion, a vision of what the future looks like that will trickle down to other people. Um, that's one uh, uh, approach. The other approach, I think is much more kind of grassroots, is in, um, in changing the kinds of people who we give our attention to. Um, so here's a really simple thing is, um, what kind of social status do you accord a teacher? It's a really good, that's a really good question to ask of a society. Are teachers at the bottom of the rung, in the middle, or at the top? Because teachers are, are really the kind of, they are the engines of soccer. They are the weak, they're the people who strengthen weak links. That's their job, right? And a, a teacher, if a teacher is doing his or her job correctly, they are spending their m most time with the students who are struggling the most, right? They're raising the bottom. The top students are fine. They don't really, shouldn't need, they, we shouldn't be spending all of our time uh, administering to the top students. There, if you are a top student, you're capable of taking care of yourself. That's what it means to be a top student, right? Um, so if you see a system where the top students are sucking up most of the attention, you know something's wrong. And if you see a system where the teachers who are doing that kind of weak link work are not being recognized and valued for that, you know something is wrong. So that's another useful thing is just to ask yourself on a very kind of personal basis, um, who am I... Uh, valuing? Who am I complimenting? Who am I rewarding in this society? I know in America there are easy answers to that question. There are many um, American states where teachers are the lowest paid professionals. Uh, you can't make any progress in the modern world where your teachers, when your teachers are the lowest paid professionals. You just can't. That's just mm -hmm. utter foolishness. And that's not a theoretical problem, I'm afraid, also in Europe, yeah. definitely. Uh, the gentleman in the far back. This morning, Gat Moma, which I had the fortune to visit your talk then too, you were talking about innovators, like very strong characters like Steve Jobs and Dr. Freirich. Um, and you said that the main characteristics of these kind of people are that they're urgent and that they're disagreeable. And how does that match with um, team playing and, and the weak link sport like football in a society? Well, uh, because I think these are complementary things. It goes back to the question that was asked earlier about do, do, do teams um, stifle uh, creativity or enhance it? And um, what I was talking about were innovators who were struggling to make their ideas real in a world that was very, very strong link. And I would argue that... Uh, Someone I was talking this morning about this, uh, a man who I think ought to be one of the most famous Hungarians, uh, a man named Emo Freireich, the father of modern chemotherapy, as important a figure in modern medicine as anyone. Had he been in an environment that was a lot more collaborative and interactive, it would have been a lot easier for him to make the, I believe, to make the, or they put it another way, the number of people who could have been a, 
permitted to pursue revolutionary ideas would have been greater in a uh, weak link environment, in a team-focused environment, than in the strong link world that he was a part of. Um, I, th I, think that, I think it enhances those kinds of, of innovators. Thank you, lady there. So um, during your presentation, what came to my mind is that I think your allegory of football versus basketball society is very much in parallel with John Rawls's philosophy of a uh, veil of ignorance in terms of we should maximize the position of the least privileged in the society. So along the lines of this theory, do you think truly that in a society which is economically and politically relied on capitalism, which very much is about consumerism, appearances, representation, and basically the, the, the redefinition of necessities, uh, can we truly achieve a football society? You know, I don't think of capitalism as being necessarily incompatible with a football society. I realize that uh, left to its own devices, what you see in capitalism is the construction of these kinds of hierarchies and the, uh, the consolidation of a lot of resources at the top. But I do think it is possible to correct for that. Um, I don't think it's an inevitable consequence. Um, I think some Western nations have struggled with that corrective process. And that's sort of what we're going through. For example, in the United States right now, where income inequality is sort of out of control, what we did was we let down our guard and we forgot that capitalism requires a kind of complementary um, effort to redistribute power and resources towards the middle. Right? Um, but I think you can do that without compromising what's good about capitalism, which is that idea that people need to be to have freedom to innovate and pursue what they uh, think is best if we're going to have productivity and growth and all the things that make for a better future. So um, I'm not a pessimist when it comes to that. I do think, though, that there are moments when we need to kind of uh, recognize that we've got to step in and kind of right the ship. Um, I'm hopeful that will happen in a lot of Western countries in the next generation. What do you think? Um, what are the characteristics and competencies of a future leader? I would say, and I'm not dodging the question, I would say that we should recognize in the future that that is an unanswerable question. And it's unanswerable because I think we need to prepare for a world where there are an, uh, uh, an extraordinarily diverse uh, group of characteristics of leaders. And as I think the failure one of the great failures of the previous world was that it had a very narrow definition of what a leader was. A leader was a, a tall, strong-willed, white male. Right? That's what, what it was. Who was sure of himself and who gave orders to others. Um, we now recognize that's an incredibly foolish way to define leadership because you basically, you know, what do tall white men represent? What portion of the population? I don't know, 15%. Why would you limit your leadership pool to 15% of the population? So if you're going to say, OK, we're going to, draw, we're going to draw leaders from a pool of everyone, then you also have to say, look, at different times in different places in different organizations, we may need fundamentally different kinds of leaders. There are times where we want leaders who are you know, leading from the, from the back, who are letting others take the. There are times when we need really, really strong, decisive leadership. But we have to recognize that, that when that era ends, boom, we don't need that anymore. We need somebody else. We need to sort of have a kind of extraordinarily diverse palette of, and I don't think any of us in this room can, com, can properly define all the different forms the future leader will take. We have no idea, right? We need to be completely open to trying different styles and models in the coming years, because we're going to come up with challenges that we've never seen before. Thank you. And to finish, maybe two, three bullet points, tips that the so-called generations they can take back home and sleep over tonight on. Yeah. I mean, I just would do one, which is I think you should be optimistic. Uh, I know it's hard sometimes, but I think the world, 
I think the next 20 years is going to be a lot better than the last 20 years. And if you think of human history as a kind of arms race between every year that passes, our problems get harder. But every year that passes, our capacity to uh, meet and solve those problems also grows. It's an arms race, right? So the question, everyone always says, well, the problems are getting harder, and that's a cause for great concern and pessimism. But they neglect the other side. Is our capacity to solve those problems mm. outracing the other side? And I think right now, it's reasonable to assume that our capacity for solving problems is increasing faster than the problems. Mm -hmm. um, why do I say that? Because we are the number of people who are being pulled into uh, positions of authority in society is greater than ever before. We're unlocking the talents of Africa. We're unlocking the talents of, we pulled, you know, in the last generation, extraordinary numbers of women into the workforce. We've essentially doubled the, 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 the number of IQ points in the workforce in the last 30 years. How can the world not be a better place if you do that, <laughs> right? In America, up until 1970, they, wouldn't assen they essentially said that no black person could ever meaningfully participate in any cognitively complex decision. That has been fundamentally changed in the, in the course of one generation. How can you not be smarter when you take 15% of your population that have been outside the decision-making process and place them inside the decision-making process? So that means, I think, when you look at that around the world, you have got to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. Malcolm, genuine, frank, brilliant, insightful, and on top of that, optimistic. Thank you very much. Thank you.